Um, I'd like to, on behalf of the promotional and filters uh, research first, I'd like to introduce our colleague from the University of Leeds, uh, Kishore Buddha, who has um, agreed to come and talk to us about um, uh, ethical consultancy in a paper called The Last Throw of the, uh, the Dice. But we decided to do something slightly different to make it more interactive and, and um, share experiences and to get more discussion going. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a more formal introduction which I hope without repetition sets some of the scene for um, the argument that uh, Kishore will play out which we will then discuss. So I'll, I'll talk for about 15 minutes um, if that's okay because I just wanted to, to show a few slides and then um, after that I think Kishore say 20 minutes yeah. you're flexible aren't you yeah. um, and then the rest of the time whatever we have left you know we can have that as interactive and have a um, discussion uh, in that space of time if that's okay good um, so I keep getting this this thing um, I've called it semiotics and commerce because semiotics is something that I'm very interested in in, but in a way, um, for the purposes of today's talk, it can be considered as a proxy for, uh, for theory, cultural studies, um, humanities-informed uh, approaches to, uh, to marketing or what marketing takes from those, uh, those approaches. So um, th this is, in some ways, um, a little bit autobiographical as a, an introduction, because I, I've been involved in a, a strange way with, with some of the issues that we're uh, going to talk about today. Um, from the, the academic and theoretical angle, um, last year I was appointed or elected as a uh, president of the International Association of Semiotic Studies. So I have a, a bit of uh, responsibility for um, looking at the way in which applied semiotics is carried through globally, okay, and I'm trying to promote it as well. So at the moment, I'm, I'm involved with, with that, but obviously I've had a long um, history of involvement with, uh, with semiotics. So in another way, that's a, a, a quite personal story, which began in the 1980s. I came to, um, I came to, to semiotics in a kind of roundabout way I was at I was doing undergraduate studies at the University of Sussex, and it was kind of an odd situation though. It's, it's difficult for you to believe now, but there was one building at the University of Sussex, the way that they run courses in those days, and it was just non-stop lectures, you know, nine till five lectures, and um, you could choose to go to them if you wanted, you know, and um, a, a lot of people did choose to go. Some were very over, oversubscribed. Uh, and somebody came to me, I, uh, I remember this woman, I can't even remember her name, but I remember this woman saying to me, there's um, a, a lecturer called Jacqueline Rose, okay, who got involved in psychoanalysis and cultural theory and so on, and she's, she's giving these, these lectures on, on this thing called semiotics, and it's like signifier and signified and stuff. You should go along and see. So I went along and saw that, and that was the first time I came into contact with, with this. It must have been about 82, 83 um, and in a way, it, it looks primitive in, in the same fashion as some of the other things that I will um, show you look, um, look primitive. Um, after being at Sussex, I was doing a PhD and I was involved in teaching semiotics um, at a whole range of London institutions. And uh, I was also teaching communication theory. This was largely on um, media courses as well. And I, I'm pretty certain that on media courses today, the topic is taught broadly in the same way. Uh, so you will get a young academic who has been assigned a course, and they have to teach a couple of weeks on semiotics as a sort of introduction to media theory or communication theory or whatever it is. And they will also teach weeks on quantitative content analysis Perhaps I might do a bit of qualitative, they'll, they'll do stuff like focus groups, um, etc. Um, and they will do some stuff on ideology. Okay, And, and I think that, that that process is largely intact now, 
you know, so so semiotics is ghettoized there, and it's forever associated with with, um, with that sphere in in media studies. Um, but it certainly was then, and that's what I was um, I was doing. And I found it was difficult to get students interested. Uh, I became a full time academic in 1992, um, and then I found this. It's from a a now partially defunct. Um, magazine called New Statesman and Society, okay, which metamorphosed into New Statesman. Um, and the, the thing that, that struck me immediately is the, the title. It's um, The Affluence of Theory, which is obviously you know, a, a play on uh, E.P. Thompson's The Poverty of Theory, which uh, had been an essay from an old-style um, British Marxist historian who um, was not very taken with the new Marxism, particularly that of Althusser, and he tried to overturn it completely um, by calling out the poverty of theory. And this is the affluence of theory, and it's about, um, mainly about uh, uh, a brand and marketing analysis company called Semiotic Solutions. Okay, and Semiotic Solutions was, this is in 1993, this article um, uh, is, uh, is published. And Semiotic Solutions um, grew out of the University of North London, where I also taught, um, although after these people. And Malcolm Evans was a, a teacher there, uh, and he had a mature student called um, Ginny Valentine, who had set up this marketing um, analysis company, and she got this young uh, Oxford graduate working with this guy called Greg Rowland, and they, they all went on to have these massive companies. Um, well, I mean, massive in relative terms. In respect of what they were doing, they had massive turnovers, okay, but in, in, in respect of personnel, they always remained very small. Um, I was talking this afternoon. You know, we hear, hear a lot about um, these SMEs, and I, I keep forgetting what SMEs, when you're applying for grants, refers to, um, because I'm, I'm slightly bamboozled by it. It's small to medium-sized enterprises. They always seem like huge enterprises to me, but these were certainly small enterprises, but, but large in ambition, um, and you know, massive really, relatively in, in terms of the amount of. Um, uh, revenue that they generated out of what was then a fairly um, limited market. Okay, so uh, so uh, Ginny has now, now died, uh, and her, her husband died as well soon after, so Semiotic Solutions disappeared. Greg is still operating, and, and Malcolm Evans um, has recently sold up his, his share of, um, of Space Doctors. Um, a few years later, I... I um, published a, a comic book, Semiotics for Beginners, and I, I, I felt that it was important to, to represent some of this endeavour in there, and I've, I'm just showing a few stills um, from that. Um, but what really happened in my relationship with uh, Ginny Valentine was kind of the other way. I, I never, ever received any invitation to do consultancy, although I would have been very well placed from many of these organisations, but I, I invited her to come and see my students, you know, because it's they, they were very fired up by having this person come in, and she was very lovable and she was very good as well. So, so they loved her. She loved doing it, you know. She used to come to my office, which was on the sixth floor, and um, and she didn't like to use lifts, you know. So I, I always saw her at the top, and she was like, I made it, I made it. So she was like very committed. Um, in this respect, so th so the relationship was kind of you know in terms of consultancy, it was the other way round for her. But I felt compelled to um, to to write about this uh, sphere of endeavour and represent it in this uh, this book, this semiotics for for beginners book. But I I'd kind of changed in that time because I was my there it is. In the, the meantime, I had um, attended a conference in... Oh, this one got the entirety of my... 
So I've got the entirety of my presentation. I'll add some more illustrations. But I, I'd attended a conference of uh, the International Association for Semiotic Studies in, uh, in Berkeley, and I'd found out that the kind of thing that we were doing in the UK had you know, only minor, very minor relevance for the broader world of semiotics. And I found out that there were all these American researchers who were doing all sorts of um, multifarious things in the world of applied semiotics, but you know, in terms of theory, they were miles in advance of us. Many of them were working on um, on cognitive um, approaches. Many of them were um, working on on purse, you know, Saussure and um, the kind of things that um, that the the brand agencies in the UK remain interested in. That they would were finished as far as um, as the Americans were were concerned, and so there was this whole new field that was opened up, and I was quite struck that um, when I came back uh, after that conference and in, in the few years after that that I was publishing, um, something something quite significant struck me. I I I spoke to to Ginny about this. And I spoke to other people who were in this sphere of endeavour. And one of the things that, um, that they said to me repeatedly was that they were suspicious that the other semiotics that I'd discovered might be positivist in orientation. Okay, that, that they wish to, um, to maintain a more... Um, for, they didn't use the word critical, but... Um, but I think that that's what they had in mind. They wanted to maintain a more critical outlook, even though they're working in the commercial sphere, um, and they wanted to maintain an outlook that was, how should we say, um, less empirical, okay, and more theoretical. Okay, so, um, and I had some slides to illustrate that, but unfortunately something's happened in, in translating those um, here. So a few years later, I tried to, tried to get to grips with this, this kind of contradictory um, issue where you have these people who, who think that they're being critical, and you know, to all intents and purposes it looks as though they're being critical in their deconstructions and then reconstructions of uh, promotional culture and then you've also got this this um, assure of, of positivism this assure of, um, of empirical work and it's um, a kind of welcome it's, it's kind of a strange mix um, a few years ago there was a, a conference series launch called Semiofest and, and I was in, invited to, to give a talk at the first Semiofest and I tried to sort of grapple with this and you know I'm not quite sure how to articulate what's going on in this interaction between the academy and the commercial sphere on the terrain of, of these cultural issues okay but I, I tried to work it through there and you know I'm hoping that the discussion today can can put us on a more uh, more sure footing in that respect. Um, essentially, just to, to throw this out for the discussion, you know, Kishore might uh, rub with this. Essentially, I, I, I think that the practitioners in um, commercial semiotics have in some ways created a, a hermetic sphere for themselves, have cre cre created a, a hermetic environment in which they, on the one hand, are missing some of the critical issues that uh, an academic mindset would bring. But they're also, um, on the other hand, um, kind of kind of avoiding um, engagement with what I would call a real deconstruction of uh, the issues that they encounter in their everyday attempts at, uh, at brand management. You know, so, so in a way, 
although they show to their clients that the, the work that they do is effective, it could be in more ways than one considerably more effective. You know, and, and I'm kind of conflicted, you know, in one sense I'd like to tell them that, but in another sense, you know, the, the entire edifice of, uh, of their practice might even fall to pieces. I think this is one of the reasons why this talk from Kishore is called The Last Throw of the Dice. Is this the last throw of the dice? I'd like you to tell us. Let's see if we can get over the It's this one. Yeah. Is that you, Kishore? Yeah, yeah. got this. So okay, let's see if I can keep this keep this under twenty. Uh, uh, so first of all, okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so thanks a lot for 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 the uh, for for the the invite. Uh, 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 it's an absolute pleasure uh, uh, to be uh, to be here uh, today. I will. So, so the the uh, the title of of the talk is is the last throw of of the dice, and by this I am sort of referring to the idea of of cultural marketing. So, is culture the last throw of the dice of of uh, uh, of of business sort of enterprises? And uh, um, so today I'll briefly talk about about. Uh, about my 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 work, um, then briefly touch upon uh, upon the uh, models of innovation within the world of branding, um, and then talk a bit about culture as a variable in uh, uh, sort of of in the field. Uh, talk also also a bit about about the cultural consultancy as an industry. Uh, uh, and then, lastly, we'll we'll uh, we'll have a discussion. Uh, so my work has spanned across uh, across products that is three dimensional products to sort of FMCG to retailing to medical sort of devices, uh, uh, food and and sort of uh, and drink restauranting. Uh, uh, I. So I'm more of an accidental academic, in the sense that I spent about 20, 20 years uh, working working in uh, in the marketing and uh, marketing branding and the branded design field. Uh, so I've kind of meandered into uh, 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 into uh, uh, into academia, and I think it was largely due to the reflections of my own practice. And uh, 
So my current research, which is uh, building on from my practice, which is around the idea of meaning-centered design. Uh, um, and I'm sort of interested in, uh, in the relationship between design uh, and, uh, and well-being, and I'm currently looking at, at aging. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really interested in the sort of ethical considerations that go before during and after and after a design uh, process. So what should be the considerations when we sort of craft a design brief? What should be the, pro uh, the sort of ethical consideration during the process of design? And then lastly, afterwards. So, um, uh, so yeah, uh, so this is my sort of research interest. Uh, so let's sort of go back to, to the beginning. And, and I'm kind of struggling with this, with this talk slightly because it is touching upon branding, it is touching upon cultural theory or cultural theories, you know, the whole field of, of sort of mass communications, uh, looking at sort of design, looking at ethics. So, so I'm sort of being quite uh, sort of uh, fast and sort of loose here. But, but the idea isn't to sort of give... Uh, uh, to give a pointed, narrow uh, presentation on, on, on a field, but to sort of map out some of these sort of issues, because these are, again, reflections more than, than a research paper. So, uh, so I think it's sort of safe to sort of assume that when we, we, when we talk about brands, one of the questions we would ask within sort of the industry would be, is that is that what is the purpose of, of a brand and what what value is 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 a brand creating and and for for who i think there are sort of predominantly three perspectives one is for the marketing sort of for for the marketer and for the consumer which is some kind of a language and some kind of of a symbolic sort of association which is formed then from a, from a business perspective, it is the idea of, of, uh, of the business having a security of future earnings. Or, or, or if, if you were a lawyer within the, within the company, then you'd be sort of interested in the value of, of the equities of the brand, whether, whether it's, a, it's a trademark uh, or, or a logo or a name. So... I think to, to a large extent, I think the whole field of marketing frames it within, within this, this uh, uh, structure. And I think uh, we're still grappling with the idea of where does, the, where does society fit in? Where does community sit in? Where, 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 where does the state fit into sort of this? And I think, I think in the context of what, has been, what we've been been hearing and uh, been uncovering about corporations in the last, I think, seven, eight years. And I think we are, we are sort of beginning to, to sort of now ask those questions as to, as to, as to who does a corporation work for. Um, so, so, so how is value created? I, I think this, this kind of pretty much, I mean, this is, this is an, an overly simplistic model, but this captures how value is, is created. So you have, have some technological or craft development, which is then taken to a firm. Sometimes this process of the development may be within the firm, and the firm then takes it to the consumer or, 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 or the customer. Uh, by the 50s, I think, uh, you know, the marketing uh, sort of industry, the firm had realized that this model wasn't working. So we, we then ended up with this consumer market pull approach where we said, okay, let's talk to the consumer and let's ask them as to what they would like you know, from us. And I think to a large extent, the whole field of uh, sort of the entry of, of the social sciences into, uh, into the field of, uh, of, of innovation, of branding has been driven by this, by this transition from, from a previous model of, of a technologist creating something to now us asking a consumer. And to a large extent, 
you know, it started off with psychology, anthropology, sociology, all of these social sciences were, were, were being, being deployed for the purposes of, of sort of understanding the consumer. Uh, and, and again, I'm being quite facetious sort of here, but, but the idea is, is to sort of map out the terrain. Um, so where does cultural studies fit into sort of this? And, and before we sort of ask and uh, reflect on that question, I think we should ask what happened to, to the fields before it? You know, uh, uh, so, uh, so what happened to psychology? Psychology in, in the 50s and the 60s was touted as this, this sort of magical field which would help, you know, because we could now sort of get inside the heads of the consumers and we could really understand what they, they sort of wanted. So then after psychology, it was, it was sort of anthropology, sociology, not in, in sort of that order. But by and large, if you look at, at changes in, uh, in, in advertising sort of agencies, then the, then the sort of breakdown from uh, or, 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 or the breakup of, of, of these agencies into sort of more specialized agency like market research than sort of the branding design, we see that, that bit by bit these fields are being marshaled and and to a large extent, a lot of these organizations started to then uh, sort of internalize these sciences, these fields into, uh, into their own practice. And I think in, this, was, this was about the time in the 90s, 92, uh, when cultural studies broke through, through, the, through the field of, of, of marketing, particularly with the, uh, with the BT campaign. And and I think uh, a certain myth about you know uh, a certain myth about the industry was created that uh, somehow cultural studies had the answers because it dealt with things that that people could not articulate something which even psychology couldn't uh, couldn't un uncover so. So, so the question is, what is what is the last throw? I think the last throw of the dice now is isn't consumer. It is this idea of meaning now. So, so brands are after meaning. What does our brand mean to the consumer? And I think it is it is it is within this frame of 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 where a brand should be located and placed. Is is I think where uh, where semiotics uh, kind of entered and said, look, we can actually we are best positioned to explain, and we can give very clear material uh, recommendations. We can actually tell you how meaning can be created, and it's quite sort of interesting that this this uh, this this sort of accidental discovery of culture. Uh, also was paddled uh, through a later development within the field of, 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 of innovation within, 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 uh, within organizational strategy. And I think uh, by 2000, this had now been, uh, been officially sort of uh, framed as that meaning was, uh, that meaning was how we should frame innovation. We shouldn't frame it around, around consumer needs or technological uh, or, or sort of around, a, uh, say, a product benefit. Uh, and so, so, sort of, uh, so the writings such as Roberto uh, 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 Verganti, who started talking about, about the role of culture and the role of, of meaning, and, and, and I think this both from a, from an, an organizational strategy and from, from, uh, from a more ground, uh, sorry, so, uh, sort of the ground up marketing practice met midway. And we have this model, uh, which is now quite prevalent, uh, which, is the, which, is, which is the application of, of culture or, 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 or the understanding of culture as a means of of defining new new uh, 
new uh, new uh, new products and and services. So it's quite sort of interesting is that you find this enterprise organizational um, uh, sort of interest in in uh, in in culture is being mirrored quite interestingly in in sort of new areas. You know whether whether it's the CIA, which is quite interested now in sort of knowing things that people will not articulate or can't articulate. So, so today, cultural studies is being marshaled for, for, for interesting projects. So you have social sciences, culture. So, so for example, uh, you know, the Pentagon is, has a massive research project working with anthropologists trying to sort of understand uh, a civil, uh, civil unrest. They've been studying the social movements. Uh, so it's sort of quite, quite interesting how cultural theory has actually found, has, has, has had more acceptance within, within, the, uh, within, within, within enterprises than within sort of academia. And it's uh, quite sort of interesting the way you had framed it, you know, uh, uh, the way cultural theory is, is framed within, within academia itself. Uh, it has, well, I think we are still in, uh, in more of, of, uh, of deconstructionist modes rather than, than, than reconstructionist uh, kind, kind, kind of, of a mode. So... Uh, this is uh, this is a recent uh, feature in in FT. So, what does a semitician do? A semitician uh, looks at popular culture and seeks seeks uh, seeks uh, seeks a manipulation of 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 the culture uh, for for commercial uh, sort of gains. Um, so, I think the it's it's so. What I've tried to kind of paint here is that we have moved away from uh, from a positivist, uh, let's ask, let's look for evidence as to what consumers want, versus this fancy sort of the widget which will solve problems, to a more social social construction of these ideas, and it is here that then we we sort of need to start talking about what are these sort of ethics of this. Because we are not talking to a consumer, and we are not talking to 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 the user, we are we are we are talking with culture. Um, so, so I guess the cultural consultancy sort of industry is again not not new. This isn't new. I mean, anthropology has been was used in sort of World War One, was used in World War Two. Uh, was has 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 been used through history, but I think it is only uh, in the last maybe 10, 15 years that there's a there's there's a more focused sort of application of these fields, and it's quite sort of interesting how ethnography was was sort of heralded as this miracle methodology because it 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 captured the truth about about users of consumers and suddenly everyone wanted to be an ethnographer and then within five years uh, what what you have is that ethnography becomes uh, first moves from being fetishized to sort of becoming commoditized so today pretty much every market research agency will have a qualitative research who is also an ethnographer what what that essentially translates into is loads of pictures Right, loads of pictures with descriptions of of the pictures, which any reasonable person could uh, could uh, uh, could could under undertake. So this is the danger, and and I'm forcing that is that what we're moving to is this early from fetishization, which happened with ethnography, with with anthropology, into its its commoditization. Where every so the same way that every um, sort of agency had 
had an ethnographer or 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 or, or, a, or a person with with a background in anthropology or ethnography, in the same way, market research agencies now have people who are sort of sort of experts in in ethnography, and the same. In the last 10 years, in my own time within the industry, I saw uh, semiotics becoming this commoditized practice. And, and I mean, it was precisely the characterization that Paul uh, referred to is this complete lack of reflexivity as to what, what are we doing with these methods? What is the method here? So on one hand, was this fetishization? Oh, this is semiotics. This is this, this, this sort of amazing thing which will sort of uncover uh, sort of uh, these insights which you couldn't otherwise. Into uh, into now, you have a few of these agencies which are these really sort of of enormous agencies, and but they work with uh, what you would call as as a black box. No one actually knows how they sort of arrive at those answers. These their frameworks, the methodologies aren't aren't available to sort of anyone to sort of, of examine. So to that extent, I feel that the whole uh, uh, the buying end is being shortchanged because you you uh, you really don't have any measure of how how does their methodology translate into a reliable insight, and I. And, and of course, this raises significant issues around because they hide behind this idea that, oh, this is not a positivist approach. And this, again, I think traces us back to, to some of the debates within, within academia because semiotics as a field has refused to sort of, of advance. Or, 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 or at least in the UK, I mean, in the rest of, of the world, there are sort of, of, of advancements being made. So then, then on the other hand, because of this, you have this issue of, of the long tail. And sort of anyone who has known this sort of the problematic of the long tail is that it leads to this fragmentation where it raises some really serious concerns about how, how, how this creative industry works. So for example, if you looked at today this notion of a hackathon, right, which, has been, which has become quite popular, which is, which is another form of, of free labor, right, where we all uh, commit to sort of giving away our free labor. And these are often organized by large, by large consultancies. And it's quite sort of interesting, the language which they sort of use. So your only uh, takeout from this is the promise that somehow this whole notion of the networking, that you have to network. So, so we've all become these free agents who have to constantly be networking. And the only material benefit that you have from those from those attendances is 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 a pizza you know i mean and 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 it's quite sort of interesting that these are beginning to sort of mirror in the world of the semiotics consultancy so we often find uh, a complete uh, so we have this sort of exploitation of cultural analysts who will often work for Wages which aren't which aren't advertised, no one knows what is being paid, how much the how much how much the client pays, so so a lot of these social media is being used for uh, for the recruitment or for the identification of 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 uh, precarious labour. So it's quite interesting. So so to me, what was interesting was that a cultural studies graduate would typically be more sensitive to the idea of precarity. Yet this field perpetuates this precarity even further. And I say this because I was a part of, of that. And you know that you have, you, you sort of play the role of the gatekeeper. Uh, uh, the, free, uh, uh, the freelancer, just like you know, the designers, they work in, in the hope that one day they will make it to those 
big corporations, or, or sorry, those big SMEs. Uh, so it is if 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 uh, uh, if uh, if it isn't looking for cheap labor, then they'll literally ask for ideas. So there's this whole notion of crowdsourcing, uh, which is which is uh, which is used again for the generation of ideas. So a lot of pitch development will take place by actually using free labor. A lot of of primary data is collected using free labor. Uh, so I think on reflection, what I found was that, look, uh, the cultural cult consultancy sort of industry isn't, so why I sort of, of, of uh, call this the last throw of the dice is for, for sort of two reasons. The claim of cultural insights is that somehow this is a superior you know, insight. This is an insight you cannot um, sort of uh, you know, obtain otherwise. My claim is that, that because these insights, the methods used aren't, aren't, aren't open for, for investigation, it is the client who is being shortchanged, A. B, I think, you know, the industry has started to sort of eat itself up. And it is going exactly this, you know, the same route as, as market research. And quite interestingly, market research has already started swallowing up, up cultural studies. So, those, so the same way they had commoditized uh, sort of ethnography, they have commoditized cultural studies. So... So, so put in an RFP to uh, to uh, to a brand consultancy, and you will get, uh, you know, creds which will say we do ethnography, we do anthropology, we do semiotics, we do, you know, shopper tracking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so that level of commoditization is happening and has happened, and this explains when I started off. So, in just to sort of give you an example. Clients were willing to pay uh, 500,000 pounds for, for, uh, for a semiotics sort of analyst. Uh, so, so the agencies that, that I would work with, I had personally billed about 500,000 pounds for a single project. But by, by the time I sort of quit the sort of industry, you were fighting for, for briefs worth 5,000 pounds. So the days of even 20, 30,000 pound projects, research uh, projects are, are quite few now. And, and, and that is, uh, that is, that is a, uh, sort of, a, uh, it is a reflection of the way the industry has kind of moved. So, <clears throat> uh, so, so, so I think that the lesson is not only for, for semiotics, but I think by and large for the social sciences, because a lot of, uh, we sort of need to sort of engage in more cutting edge work to, to, to show how this is applied. And I think uh, uh, sort of as, as long as cultural sort of analysis is going to remain in the realm of, 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 of deconstruction, I think this 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 will only worsen, you know, uh, which is interesting because linguistics, language meaning is of is of great importance to to someone like Google, someone who's who's a policy sort of the maker. I mean, so someone like uh, like me, I'm looking at how does uh, how does the failure of a care system uh, sort of affect. Uh, 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 an older person, and I'm sort of interested in in what meanings do people make of of care systems, therefore of the government. So I think there's there's a real sort of opportunity to sort of apply these models for more more interesting community social based projects. You know where we have all a shared and a vested interest than just uh, you know sort of the interest of of a shareholder. 
so how should we then design uh, you know a, a healthcare system which can respond not on the basis of of only uh, um, uh, an an illness which needs to be treated but the way we then understand it and therefore respond to various uh, situations which which cannot be handled by 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 a single system and and i think it is it is it is it is only through 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 a more robust engagement with meaning that that we can but but more importantly not just engagement to sort of uncover but more importantly we need models of of sort of reconstructing it into services into communications into sort of artifacts into uh, uh into into policies yeah thank you right uh, 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 i think there's a number of um, things to di discuss but, but just a short list um i think the issue of free labor is a, a, a problem but um, that is a bit of this um uh, intellectual property, okay, intellectual um, integrity, and what was that last one you were just talking about? What he said. I think. Policy. <laughs> Pol uh, absolutely. Uh, policy and uh, uh, the, the future of, uh, of intellectual labour in this sphere. And other things. Yes, I think I'm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen on, uh, on how we might create tangible things using these insights. I think to, to a large extent we have spent a lot of time uh, doing a deconstruction, so which, which is what I guess uh, we, we, sort of, we are accused of a lot. With that point, you, you have tell me what it stands for, tell me what I should do. Uh, and and I find the answers engaging with designers to be interesting because designers are, are in a way semiticians. They are they're constantly thinking of signification and they use materials, so they use colors, materials, finishes, form, function as, as a means of either subverting the meaning. So if you took the sort of LSE kettles, uh, so if anyone has 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 come across the uh, this Italian brand called LSE, they transformed the kettles into uh, into these uh, childhood clay objects. And in some of my own research, which involved uh, things such as appliances, so a lot of work which I find interesting uh, is around things because then you can actually engage with meaning and, and, and you can throw a challenge to a designer. You can say, this is what it means, and I would like to sort of change the meaning. And the designer can actually then uh, sort of engage in that, uh, that reflection to sort of propose, okay, does this make sense? And then you would say, well, maybe yes or no, you know. Uh, um, Any questions, comments, interventions? Ben? Uh, um, that was a really helpful talk. It sort of clarified something which I've been, I think, observing in, in sort of seeing some of these uh, agencies go about their work. Um, and, and really, it, it, for me, what sort of clicked was in your talk, it's about the nature of profit for these organisations, like how do they make profit? And, and something that Paul said at the beginning about, you know, oh, dismissing this other, this other research, because it's, what's, what's, what's become very clear to me is this is not about rigour. Like, rigour is not important here. What's important is, is taking the idea of research and turning it into a product which these agencies can then sell on to, to their clients. It's a rhetorical device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what, what they do is, you know, exactly that black box thing is they, they come up with, with what they call a methodology, which is it's actually, it's not on the, it's a, it's a, me, it's a mechanic, right? Because it can be designed by someone and it can be repeated by anyone in that organisation who can be thrown out to a client 
and can do an ethnography or even an auto ethnography or or like or any, any one of a number of different words which are drawn from 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 the research yeah and ethnography like there's all sorts and 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 what what happens is is the profit comes from not having to repeat that initial research design so like you know if your eyes are doing research we'll invest our time into designing it properly thoroughly thinking through going through the literature making sure we've got some you know a very robust understanding of the field but but these organizations it's not it's about it's not having a repeatable method which means that their profit is from only having to do that that work which we do as the core thing at once but what interests me about this whole dynamic is what so what at what point how do these these kind of quite enigmatic companies how do they retain the profitability in their own reputation when essentially you know, if it's just a rhetorical device and it may not actually be repeatable, which means it may not actually be that good or effective, what is, is it purely just the fact that it's a trend and there's just another client that comes along? Or, you know, what actually, how does that kind of work? Is so it's sort of quite, quite interesting how the, uh, how the field is kind of organized. So there are, so, so we have these uh, people who are considered to be, uh, to, to, uh, to be the sort of originators of the field. And you have uh, the upstarts, and it's quite interesting if you if you were to sort of follow what they're doing. So the upstarts have started uh, things like a conference series. Many of them seek an academic, uh, some sort of an academic engagement, so that that is a part of their CV. Uh, and. And it's quite interesting is that it has also, um, quite ironically, our own discourse of impact has meant that, that leading Russell Group universities have some of these people who you, 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 you wouldn't give a master's, uh, a person with an, with an MA, a course to teach. And some of these run courses. So it's quite sort of, uh, of interesting how this plays out. Um, so one hand they do a gatekeeping, so there's a huge amount of, of gatekeeping which goes on. Uh, so so the commercial field, so their buyers, so, so let's start with who their buyers are. So their buyers are either the corporations themselves, which is brand, brand or the marketing uh, so heads or the marketing managers, uh, else it would be a branding agency which might need uh, a specialist input or it sort of might be an advertising agency. So they effectively do a gatekeeping of this. And that is where the sort of exploitation of, of, of legality comes in. So it's quite interesting how one person sitting in London is an expert on Turkish uh, culture and can actually deliver to a client a uh, project which, where they would have paid, uh, in effect, roughly about a thousand pounds for a week's work, uh, while they would themselves bill the client uh, roughly about fifteen hundred to about uh, about two thousand uh, pounds per per day. So the client would have been charged about uh, between ten to uh, about seven to fifteen thousand pounds for a week's work, while while for the freelancer who has done the entire work would have been paid about a thousand pounds. So so there's that element of power of old fashioned power which is at play here. Uh, the other way is status. So you organize conferences, you have academic uh, sort of affiliations which you then have on your C V. So someone like Paul would be approached for insights, but he would never be be introduced to the client. I've had no money. I've never had any money. You should have answered why that is. It's because you made the mistake of actually writing textbooks on how to do it. You well, are. You, know, such, you, you have a accountable method. Paul, which, which, is, yeah. which is interesting. His book. Do you know that his book is the most uh, used book? So if if any of these practitioners have. Uh, need to sell semiotics, they would say, please read Paul on this book. Your book is, is the Bible. Because there's pictures in it, you know, but they don't normally understand pictures. <laughs> uh, I think. But, but, I mean, we were discussing that this, is, this issue, you know, this, this 
issue running right through the impact agenda, which is precisely about the cunning of uh, resting surplus value and the, the fetishism of commodity, whereby we have our own copyright system, don't we, as, as academics, which is called referencing. Right, so so nobody's idea can be, you know, in the, if you're uh, uh, penalised for plagiarism, that's the worst thing that could ever happen. But but copyright rules are waived, you know, in the, in the current arrangements that we have for collaborating with SMEs and for uh, for maintaining our own ideas in in uh, the impact agenda. So there's a fundamental imbalance there. I mean, I've, I've always been intrigued by, by the fact that the, the, the old school Marxists that I've dealt with on publishing projects and so on before, they've always been keenest about getting paid and getting their money. And for, for good reason, you know, there's a lesson to be learned from, from this, I think. Because it's absolutely rampant and rife. I think this is a, a kind of crisis point for that kind yes, of yes. mentality. So, 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 so to me that this problem manifested within the cultural... So of experts themselves, to me, is proof that nothing is immune to this decay. Uh, you, 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 you would have thought that that at least the cultural uh, sort of analysts would see would see through their own. You know, for example, I've I've asked uh, multiple times. Look, you guys use use crowdsourcing, frankly, to uh, to for the generation of insights. Uh, which you will then uh, claim that you have actually done this work. The least that you should do is at least share back your your findings, you know, uh, which isn't again practiced. So to me, the fact that that people would be sensitive to the culture. So for example, this what this shows is a complete lack of the understanding of the sharing of the culture. I think that relates to sort of the Henry Jenkins and the spreadable media thing. This notion that value is kind of, you know, there's, there's the relationship between the consumers and feeding back and crowdsourcing all these things. And what is missing, I think, from that is the critical discussion precisely of there's a point at which all those surfaces are actually, you know, somebody is creaming off a, a, an actual profit. And this, this whole, it becomes a very ephemeral idea of value that is, and again, it's not, it's not actually located within or with the, the, the people that originate it. So yeah, it's, it's very problematic. So I found that that notion of um, of the very cultures that they would claim to sort of represent, they had no no solidarity with that culture. So it almost seemed that they uh, that they viewed that culture to be uh, so so okay. This is um, I mean, a cultural inter um, uh, so interaction should fundamentally transform you. Right? That is the nature of culture. When, 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 if I have visited China and if it and if it hasn't transformed my 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 sort of dietary habits, then something has 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 sort of gone missing. You know? This is this is the fundamental nature of, of culture. And, and I find people to be quite immune to those cultural interactions. So, so it's almost as if culture had become this very uh, sort of inanimate thing which could be traded and that surplus value could be then generated. Um, so, so, so I find that to be, uh, I mean, any uh, sort of, of anthropologists have been, been accused of sort of going rogue. You know, it's, it's that, that notion of, of, of the encounter is quite a powerful one. You know, reading a literature, you know, a piece of, of, of James Joyce or, of, or, or, or J.D. Salinger fundamentally changes the way you think about, about the world. So I found that to be absolutely missing. People would look at you and say, "What are you, 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 you on about?" You know. So, so I think my 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 central thesis is that that the cultural con consultancy, so the industry itself, does not understand culture. In the conclusion to your your talk, the. the Instead, we do something more useful 
than the self-perpetuation that is, is going on in those areas of yeah. commerce that are using culture in this instrumental fashion. I'm, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because this is a kind of this is an issue which is kind of vex, which vexes me a lot, and so I'd be interested to see your thoughts. And it's this idea of you said you know these cultural analysts don't understand culture, and it's the last throw of the dice, and so on. But if you think about culture as, as having been so thoroughly saturated with these promotional devices and imperatives and so on, but there's no in a sense, no sense going back from that. But then also that's just it's culture is dynamic anyway, so it's just it's you know, culture changing. Um, is there a case to say that actually maybe we misunderstand culture if we, if we can't see that <laughs> whatever we think is bad is actually just culture? So that's complicated. Let me explain. There's, I'm a cyclist, and um, there's been a huge upsurge in both this country and more generally um, in the last kind of 10 years of interest in cycling. And you've got loads of new kind of brands and companies coming out. And there was, there was one brand that really drove a new way of thinking about cycling and kind of, and certainly for a mass audience in the UK, it's a brand called Rafa, which is completely design driven. And it was the combination of a cycling enthusiast and a marketing expert from a design background. And basically what they identified was, was that cycling was a niche sport becoming popular. But because it was niche, there was no real, people had a vague sense of the history of this sport. And all these myth, myth and it's full of myth and romance. Because basically there wasn't any, you know, there was no archive TV footage, there was no programs, there was no representation. And so Rafa was a brand born out of inventing heritage. And because there's no, you know, people are suddenly interested in cycling, but there's nothing for them to really, you know, read in their Sunday papers or to kind of, you know, once they've got off their bike to actually engage in. And so Rafa invented this stuff. They started producing photo books for people to kind of leisurely consume. They produced clothes, which, you know, you can actually go on, you know, you don't have to buy, but you can leisurely browse and feel like you're kind of part of this thing. They invented a heritage. And traditionalists, you know, the niche traditionalist cyclists have said, Oh, this is bloody awful. You know, like cycling is, is just terrible. We've got all these lovely, you know, these all these cycling clubs where we get up at five in the morning. You know, that's what cycling is, you know. But actually, and I'm part of this club and we have these debates all the time. And and then it's, you know, I, I think we're missing a trick here because the point is, is that, you know, cycling culture has changed. And now there is part of cycling is the Johnny Come Lately who buy all the kit. But they feel they do, you know, what who's to say they don't fashion? Who's to say it's not a genuine, authentic pleasure and you know, and so this is what I'm interested in, this notion that, that but that's the promotional culture, if you like. And I think, and there's the whole of this heritage branding, you know, this is the invented kind of past and so on. And I'm just wondering, you know, are we misunderstanding culture if we don't understand that the promotional culture is very much part of that culture? I think, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that, I'm just devil's advocate. Yeah. Yeah. I think the ground up contestation of culture is fine. My reference here is to to the enterprise model of the creation of culture. Mm -hmm. So now, for, for, for example, large, large enterprises want to create culture. That is my, my issue. And my issue isn't that they're doing it. My issue is that they're, that they're wasting a lot of, 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 the, or, of the money. And uh, this is just becoming the last throw of the dice in the sense that we are witnessing uh, sort of the implosion of these models of innovation and that a more ground up approach has to sort of emerge, which has to be led by the community, by, 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 by a different enterprise kind of a model, you know, which, which seems... Yes, but what kind of model then, because if we see that as an example, there may be two options. One is what the world of collaborative economy would uh, see as models like peer-to-peer -peer communities and stuff, but there's also things like Uber or Airbnb, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they are very different models than the ones that, for instance, uh, software developers are experimenting yeah, yeah. or different sorts of communitarian activity yeah, yeah, yeah. that takes place in similar ways, yeah. co-working spaces. Yeah, yeah. Other, I mean, there's the the way, the actual way in which this then comes up to be may be very very different. No, absolutely. I think rather than uh, depending on these intermediaries, I think the problem has been that you've always needed these very specialist intermediaries who can somehow come up with with a magical solution. So first it was the technologist, then it became the sort of, of advertiser, then it became the researcher. Now it is the cultural researcher. So the point is that none of this is actually working. 
95% of all new product launches fail. Right. This is a fact. Uh, the, 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 uh, but, then, but then on the other hand, uh, uh, to what extent uh, can, uh, can we depend on, on, on entirely a ground up uh, sort of approach? We have, we have no, no way of speculating. So the only way I would see is that we've got to look out for those new, new instances, those new sites where, where, where interesting uh, things might be happening. But then we should also be reminded of things which have happened in the past. So for example, if you look at the idea of a body shop, body shop which was founded on very lofty principles, was sold for $295 million to, to one of the biggest uh, cosmetics company, you know. So yes, we can, uh, I'm out rather be an optimist, <laughs> you know, so we just need to, to sort of, uh, I think the sort of academy is where we can reflect on, on these ideas. And I think it is when, my problem is that if, if institutions are starting to sort of teach commoditized semiotics, and I think that's the problem. It's really interesting you said because we're, I mean, we're, we're at the cold face precisely of this kind of this issue. And we have, I mean, I've got one second year course I teach, which does precisely that. And, and I, you know, I, I encourage students to, you know, we have a rigorous research methods course. When it comes to, I say, in this other module called promotional practices, the point of research methods is it's a rhetorical device. You know, it, and essentially, it doesn't matter if it's, a non-repeatable kind of um, you know piece of insight. The point is, it's got to do a job of selling that idea to a kind of client. Um, and then, but then we have the, the way we put rants when we design the degree. If you remember, then we had they do this, but in the third year they have a course called Issues in Promotional Culture, which gets them to rethink what they've done in the context of a whole series of debates. Um, and they take other courses which are about political economy and so on. And so it's uh, you know the way you know the way we address this is is to give them, show them how these tools are used in a commercial context, I mean, but then try and kind of help them to understand the implications of this. And that's the point where ethics kind of comes in. I, I think it's just hugely challenging because, you know, the, 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 the position of you know, us as lecturers in, a, in an AG institution, which is marketing degrees, which the primary, one of the primary selling points has to be employability because that's the logic of AG now, you know. The idea that you'd come and you'd be interested in semiotics because you're interested in culture and meaning and you want to be Engaged and transformed by all these wonderful ideas, like you know, that, that's that's not that's not where higher education sits, or at least you know, yeah. in this this bit of the sector, sits in terms of our, of our culture. So it is it is about sort of trying to teach rigor and you know give students that experience of transformation, but it's also it has to be. And I think it is, it is here, but uh, if there is some model of reconstruction where you can then start sort of asking the question, okay, how did you reconstruct? That. What what was what was the basis? Why not do this? It's when we uh, sort of half equip them and they are then unleashed onto the world, where they don't have that reflexivity as to about what they're doing. And I think that, that is where where because I teach uh, I teach a module um, uh, on a course called uh, fashion marketing. And um, so, so I sort of run them through the various theories, uh, but then I did put them through an exercise where I said, okay, now you've got to apply to this and please come up with a brief. And then we sort of discuss the brief and we ask about the, the implications of the brief, you know. And uh, so I think this, these are still early days, but I think as, as educators, we need to think through these these pedagogical issues. Mm. I mean, I mean, that's I mean, I've, I'm trying really hard to. You know, we've got an advertising, PR, and media degree, so it's students want to learn about advertising and PR. But what we do is our, in our research, and what we we try and encourage to do that the structures precisely to make them reflexive, mm -hmm. but also the, place the emphasis on on social campaigning. And the point of that, and where I suppose the ethics kind of comes in. And not necessarily the ethical consultancy where it's a kind of a greenwashing ethical <laughs> consultancy, is this notion of what's the end outcome at a kind of social, political, cultural level. And that's the, you know, that's the consideration. And um, 
you know, but of course the irony there is is that you know possibly even after after cultural cultural theory and cultural research, the next thing is is activism, like is the next big source for um, for for commercial commercial practice, and particularly in, in advertising and PR. So so our sort of attempts to sort of go back to, to what's what's the what's the which constructive is, sort of thing. Which is quite which is quite quite interesting because uh, one of the latest theorizations I've come across is this notion of brands and complexification. So brands don't brands should uh, don't so they are they are either already or they should not present a simplistic um, solution. Instead, what they should do is encourage the consumer to reflect critically. So yes, you may still have a consumer who might think that that I'm that I'm transforming global uh, sort of inequality. But because of the way you structure the messages, you leave enough ambiguity for the, the consumer to say, well, actually, this is bullshit. You know? mm. But I will buy it because I have no choice. And I think that level, that, that little splitting open. This sounds really similar to the whole kind of what's happened with the, um, is it Putin's advisor? He's this, basically this kind of new kind of PR spin. It's the same kind of thing. What do they call it? The kind of, it's not complexification, but it's basically confusion, the kind of communication of confusion. And it seems like the same kind of thing. It's an incredibly powerful rhetorical tool to kind of, both on the one hand, keep your opponents second guessing, but also the people you want to engage with. They never actually quite know what you stand for, but it sounds very appealing, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my position is slightly, you know, it seems slightly oblique, but to me it's it's, it's logical on, on these issues. You know, it's not fully worked out as, as anyone else is, is, but you know, people have said, you know, how how can you, you know, why why do you think it's a log logical pro progression to be interested in in biosemiotics and cognitivism and so on, um, you know, from a uh, a left leaning um, you know Marxist position, and my beef with um, with this sector is that a lot of the work that they do in semiotics, you know, not only does it seem old fashioned to me, you know. Um, the example I always give is that it's like the uniform. You know, you, you, you send in these long essays with references in, and the references stopped. You know, the, the, the most recent references were the ones that, like, were the year that he dropped out of university. You know, so he's read nothing else since. So, so I have that beef against it. But, but the, the other beef is that, um, that it works, what they do. You know, and the clients love it, you know, to, to a certain extent, or they have over the last 15, 20 years. You know, so it's been repeated, you know, and we have, we have started to do it in, um, uh, in uh, the courses that we teach. But, you know, in, in the sort of hardcore world of, of theoretical semiotics, which regrettably has stayed too theoretical rather than empirical, um, they've kind of, like, moved on. And, you know... For my money, it's impossible to do that kind of, um, of theory and semiotics in, in general and uh, cultural studies without asking questions about, you know, what, what does it mean to be a human? You know, if you have a, a, a version of, uh, of the human based on everything being constructed in discourse, you have a very limited version of what it is to be a human. What are the continuities between humans and animals? You know, if you do a semiotics based on, on that, then ultimately you have to start asking yourself about, you know, how, how do I care for the animal world? And then there's the plant world after that. You know, what is our consanguinity with the plant world? You know, what is our ethical um, commitment to that? What do we do when we destroy that part of the world? And, and you know, it's a, the perpetuation of this, this particular paradigm, you know, because it works in a local area, which I... Um, I don't know if it's too strong to say that I find it offensive, but it's it's that that I object to. But also, there's there's one bit which I forgot to sort of mention. It is we 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 also need to reflect on how enterprises work. And I would go back to the idea of the shareholders. So so if we are to look at enterprises, enterprises are still driven by 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 a, 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 the annual reports. And then you have the quarterly report. So today CEOs, their lifespan is as 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 short as a, as a quarter. 
right? Which means that there's a real, which has happened now, is that semiotics is yet another insight which is ticked off by the marketing head. Yes, we have consumer research, standard focus groups, survey, blah, blah, blah. And we also have insights. So, so, so please don't blame me. This is the so this is this is the other side of, of the problem, where uh, where uh, on one hand, for example, if you uh, then if you understand the marketing organization, so if you if you took an, an organization like Nestle, where you may have someone who has only about two three years of experience who may be given a brand to handle. Uh, you know, a small brand, and you would be interacting with the person. Then on the other hand, you may have a mid, you know, mid-level sort of manager. So it's quite interesting how that sociological uh, sort of understanding of how these organizations, the buying all sort of organizations work, how they then shape a lot of this this engagement. So to so I have in my years of practice, I didn't find any evidence that. I mean, unless this was bought at the highest level, that's the CEO said, right, I also need that person because that person can solve the, you know, the problem. Else it was just a routine marketing exercise where you just, you know, a tick box. And an alibi by the sounds of it for, uh, absolutely, for absolutely. executive decisions. Absolutely, so, so this is the other bit which needs to be researched. Again, I don't find in the marketing literature, I find there is very little, literature about the sociology of marketing sort of organization. It is, branding is sort of taught as if it was a truth, you know. No one actually looks at how these these day-to-day these day -day workings of the marketing organizations shape shape the decision. But it's often because it's, it's furtive, isn't it? You know, I mean, if we really knew what went on in that Tesco boardroom, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd try and buy it out on the earth. I mean, a good, good example there, and especially the other kind of the, from the design side is um, you know, the Cadbury's Gorilla campaign, mm -hmm. which is kind of huge success. And there are all kinds of reasons within the ad industry for why they came up with that. Mainly, it was a play by this agency to kind of create a niche for them because they're USB to do this kind of advertising and so on. Um, but of course, you know, there, there was lots of design. You know, there was lots of you know, kind of okay, so we're using the colours, yeah. all these things, and you know, there's a lot of semiotic and kind of stuff. And then, of course, they had the follow-up ads that are absolutely bombed. And the, the agency, um, there's a researcher in the project called Keith, who um, said he got a call from, from Gleisen's agency who were pa totally panicked. Because, you know, they'd done all the semantic things. They'd used the same, you know, kind of uh, colour signatures. Yeah. And all that kind of stuff should, in theory, work, but it didn't. And so, and then, and, and he was, he comes from a kind of psychology, cognitive kind of psychology background. Um, or at least that's how he uses his research. Um, and he said they were just panicking, and they were just saying, can you give us the answer? <laughs> so is that... Uh, it's yeah, so, so there's, there's, that, there's that element, which is, again, never discussed, you know. No one actually uh, trains up marketing students. How, how, how do you take a decision? You know, how, how do you know that one created this better? Right? I mean, this, this goes back to, 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 to the issues around creative. What makes a creative, you know, Better. Um, so yeah, the, the issue who decides board. what better is. Spot, uh, speaking as a creative, who decides what better is. <laughs> you know, the, you know, but I think this, the, these are all uh, these these would be things that I would interact on on a day to day basis. These would be challenges and complexities where you would have explained, where you would have used significant rigor, and it would turn out that it was the marketing uh, heads, his wife. Of opinion, which shaped his, his decision. Which raises an interesting point, I think, because you were talking about how we could maybe use this stuff to make, you know, these broad ideas to make better policy decisions. And, you know, my experience of working in PR and campaigning is that you, you never know what's going to hit. Sometimes you, you, you know, sometimes you chuck something out there and it runs away, it runs away from you and it becomes huge. And sometimes you put a load of work in and you get nothing back. Yeah. And it, it, you know this idea that how we could maybe develop better policies when we don't really know how, you know, we don't really know how it works. We're not, and maybe it's maybe it's unknowable. Maybe it's just, you know, maybe there's an element, you know, it's, there's an element of chance underneath it all. You know, being at the right time at the right place rather than being 
right at the right time, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, and whether you know you could feed that back into you mentioned the NHS, whether it could so you know whether we could solve problems in the NHS using this for hard processing. I think the the, the uh, there my only uh, response would be uh, that there aren't enough rigorous frameworks by which that knowledge for speculation because the decision to sort of take one creative route or 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 the other is is speculation. There isn't enough rigor that goes in. No. So, 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 so the extent to which people are claiming that I have this magical solution, then it's then then you might as well just sit around, at, you know, a table and come up with with ideas. I mean, ultimately, doesn't this just track back to the question of political economy and the kind of you know, the overarching frame in which these you know these things happen? I mean, in, you know, the case of, of kind of healthcare designing. Using um, semiotics, a, a, a kind of developed uh, semiotics to understand human ethical considerations. Um, it kind of so long as if, if healthcare, for instance, is a is, is a market based system, you will always have uh, some people that use that insight to develop a commercial solution, which may or may not work. But if it doesn't work, then you know they'll just start another company and whatever, and just keep going it. Whereas if you have a, a non market based system. Then, come what may, you need something which, at, at, at a basic level, addresses a certain need, and for better or worse, you know, just is a work in progress and so on. I mean, I mean, I mean, isn't it? It just depends on us getting a good government elected. <laughs> there, there are, are other issues, you know. I mean, we we um, we mentioned in, in terms of like cultural studies being employed, you know. There was a time when cultural studies person was the guru, but now now you refer to him as, as the gimp. Yeah. <laughs> now but, uh, every creative has a cultural studies um, uh, gimp. So I, I, I was, I was going to um, say you, um, you you didn't mention, but you had some suggestions for um, for the future to um, to render that gimp. Um, more active, uh, and it was, was to do with interdisciplinarity, wasn't it? Uh, actually, I'm, I think there's, there's a need for, for different people to sort of engage with this in, in, in a truly multimodal way, and I think we need to stop uh, looking at problems from a particular disciplinary uh, sharp knife. Problems aren't the sort of experience within a vacuum or, or within a with a narrow, uh, so, so this whole notion of choice is so much framed within this need base. I have this need and I will want something which leads to, to, uh, to either a, psych, you know, a psychological understanding or, 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 or usability based, based understanding than a totality. So for example, my laptop isn't merely just there for computational or for data sort of entry process, it is much, much more. And so to that extent, I find design as a field to be really interesting because design isn't a field. Design has drawn from the fields of psychology, anthropology, semiotics, uh, sort of engineering, uh, um, you know, from, from, uh, from material sciences, etc., etc. And a designer tends to, uh, to look at a problem from, from a totality perspective. And um, uh, and I think uh, to that extent, those people should be uh, you know uh, should be armed to sort of locate their their engagement from that uh, from the totality of the experience. So, I mean, I think design is a really interesting example um, of how that might work. But I think that there's a, there's a general question about institutional capacities for knowledge when you're thinking about you know something like that. So so my my worry about saying something has to go you know as interdisciplinary as you can get and you you address the problem with the right you know with the field of thought that's most appropriate to to answering the questions that arise right is how do you know which fields they are how do you know what the different answers from different fields are and 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 how does that fit together because the risk then ends up being you end up back to the quarterly report with like tick, I've done the semiotic, tick, I've done the material. 
you know, and you, and you cover all bases poorly. And, and I, I think I think you're right, but I think the question of how you do that is is hard. So that my my response would be: what we need is an an an, an ontological turn of of of, uh, like of the disciplines. What we have here are we we sort of use the term into disciplinality, but we aren't actually being truly inter discipline. So, so my my encounter with literature does not transform me. It just leads to okay, fine. That is what you do, and this is what I I sort of do. Right. Um, and I think what this this is this is a bigger sort of intellectual challenge, which can't be resolved immediately. But I think through research projects we can start reshaping it. Design did that. You know, it it sort of never tried to theorize it because you know, okay, this is how this is all you sort of need to know. Uh, the design students uh, have been encouraged to think about about politics, about gender, uh, about uh, about the idea of usability, uh, which l led to the whole idea of, of equality. So the whole thing around uh, uh, sort of how how ergonomics as a discipline and and the usability studies, which is actually solving a uh, a very instrumentalist uh, need of what should be the grip strength on on a door handle. It actually then ended up becoming a political way of understanding design, and and that transformed the whole notion of uh, universal sort of design. You know, and I don't think uh, within marketing we think of a universal brand. Uh, so it's quite interesting how the idea of, of universality as an idea, something which which treats all the users equally, you know, like even now has been so fraught in in terms of its its implementation. So, uh, so yeah, which I don't have, have the answer. For this. No, no, I agree. I, I, uh, I don't think. We can underestimate the challenge, but I, I am struck, though, that in the list of people of you know list of disciplines that have been dropped su successively by you know, you know, by commerce, you know, anthropology considered as a master discipline initially, but then, then you know superseded by psychology, you know psychology for a while considered as a master discipline, yeah. but then eventually you know you get to cultural studies, which was considered as a master discipline, but we kind of we folded in on ourselves if we are cultural studies. You know, the number of times I've given papers and, and you know declared semiotics. You know, the first question is: you were talking about a meta narrative, right? Which which is imperialistic. And yeah, I, my response to the question is: no, no, it's not imperialistic. I, I know somebody who, who specialises in postage stamps and. A man who specialises in wine labels, that's, that's real specialism, but we've, we're kind of crumpled instead of like saying, yeah, you know, we, we do try to be um, interdisciplinary, we, 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 do, we do promote that, we, we want a broader, um, broader vision. I mean, I don't care that they've dropped us, you know, particularly as the way that they've so instrumentally used the academy over the, over the yeah. years, but I do think it's significant that um, you know that they they've probably been dropped for, you know, not fulfilling the pretensions of a, uh, a master discipline or a master narrative. I can actually approach the clients, or I can actually uh, 
I mean, I need to research, obviously, how I can actually use this terminology, like you were talking about. I've, I've tried them. So not pen, Pentagon, about Pentagon. So obviously, all the governments they are using sorts of like really secret messages to each other and as I say and stuff. They're like researching about people, they're trying to learn what they're gaining from our like robots and stuff. So do you think how we can actually use this semiology or how I can use this semiology to be able to uh, improve my own design or kind of like sell my design? Are you thinking of going on Dragon's Den? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, well, I, I can only echo what um, students said to me throughout the 90s. Every year I would, I would get a call from one or more students who kept in touch with me. You know, these are just the ones that kept in touch. And they would say, do you know, that's, that stuff that we did in class, that, that um, uh, semiotic analysis and, um, and so on, um, it's precisely the stocking trade of um, working in a creative, in an ad advertising agency. Mm -hmm. But um, we're never allowed to mention it. Uh, it's because of something. I think it's a, a very sort of curious situation where you know the, the vocabulary of, um, of academic semiotics. You know, is precisely a, a appropriate to the practice, but it's not something that's that's articulated. You know, so it's it's often formalized. Uh, sorry, informalized, naturalized, and you know, for want of a better word, professionalized mm -hmm. in uh, in various parts of uh, of uh, industry and commerce. So, the only advice that I could give, you know. I wish I'd give more, I wish I knew more about it, is, is to try and traverse that line if you, you know, if that's the world that you wish to, to inhabit. Um, it's a difficult one. I think that, you know, those students that have come back to me have kind of like learned by, possibly by mistake, possibly by mentioning some more academic jargon and <laughs> being told off by their line manager. The other ways uh, just apply apply the learnings of semiotics. So uh, so Paul Cobley's book would be the best start start with that. And locate uh, locate those principles of semiotics within your own practice. Okay. So if you were describing a chair, talk about the signs of of, of, of the chair, talk of the, about the, the signifiers of the chair. And then talk of the signified and, and, and the myths that you see, but, but of course you have to then place it within the broader cultural context. A chair can't generate meaning on its own. Right? It has to it sort of creates meaning in reference to some other things. I understand it. I, I had um, Sosa or Robin Bass. I'm actually in love with Bass. <laughs> um, Don't tell your employer. <laughs> I think that's I think that's true. These things, when you're putting together stuff, you can break them down and use the techniques. But if you start, but if you actually start referencing them, yeah. clients tend to look at you like you're a lunatic. And unless, of course, it's in a very carefully branded schema where this is a product that you're selling yeah. specifically. Yeah. Okay. So, so if, if, if I can freelance uh, designers, I can do anything I can. It just helps in uh, in your own reflection. Believe me, it. It sort of makes things very clear for you, which means even if you use, even if you sort of explain it in lay terms, you can at least explain the concepts that you have internalized. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, say say whatever it is that you design has cultural resonance. You know, like you can use like smart but not necessarily technical language. Yeah, yeah. yeah denature the vocabulary a little bit. You know, the um, de academicize it. But, okay. but only do it for the next few years, because once I <laughs> have effected revolution, <laughs> all people in these, <laughs> right these industries <laughs> will have to use references in the way that we do. <laughs> <laughs>
guess the bullshit. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot. Or, or you could do it from within. Um, I'm not learning. It's in, in, in my mind, actually. I don't see it. I'm going to do something. <laughs> I'm definitely doing something. Okay. Well, I, I will call you up in a couple of years and say, what news of revolution? It's a struggle. It will take time. But anyway, thanks for your question.